<laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to Museum Moments with the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee. I am Dan Humschel, the Director of Education, and with me today is Samantha Goldberg, who is the Director of Education at the Holocaust Education Resource Center. Hi, Sam. Hi, thanks for having me today. Thank you for joining me. I think you're kind of a regular on Museum Moments, is that right? I mean, one or two times, I'd say. I don't know if that makes me regular. <laughs> That's pretty regular. That's pretty regular, I'd say. So thanks for coming back. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about Chiuni Sugihara. Um, the reason we're talking about Chiuni Sugihara at the Jewish Museum in Milwaukee is because of our exhibit currently ongoing, Then They Came For Me, The Incarceration of Japanese Americans During World War II and the Demise of Civil Liberties which is uh, free and open to the public thanks to the Yabuki Family Foundation until May 29th. So come on down before that exhibit leaves us. Um, while Chuni Sugihara is not one of the people who was incarcerated during World War II, he is a citizen of Japanese descent who played a pivotal role during World War II and was in fact involved in a heroic mission ultimately to get uh, thousands of Jews out of the Soviet Union, Poland, and primarily Lithuania, where he had been stationed there. I'm going to present just a brief overview of Chuni Sugihara, and then Sam will, uh, Sam and I will return to our conversation. So <clears throat> this is a, a very um, common photo of Chuni Sugihara. If you have ever heard of him before, you've probably seen this photograph. Um, some people have called him the Japanese Schindler um, because of the number of people he saved and the willingness that he um, uh, that he had to put his self, himself on the line for the benefit of other individuals. Um, so one of the things that he did uh, because he was stationed in Lithuania and when Lithuania was occupied by the Soviet Union, um, the ways of people to emigrate out of Lithuania and out of the Soviet Union were very, very difficult. Um, and as the Nazis approached this area of the world, um, things became even tighter. So for the Jews who were trapped in Lithuania, there was really the only one way out. And that was by traveling across the Soviet Union by train primarily to get to the Japanese empire. And so what Chuni Sugihara did was issue a uh, a number of visas. Um, estimates are that he issued as high as 10,000 visas during uh, a very short period of time um, between late 1940 and early 1941 um, that were travel visas that uh, were supposed to make people uh, allow people to get to Japan and then on to the next location. Um, but they often didn't have a second destination. So he would write visas in a way that were borderline legal. <laughs> they would get people out of, of the Soviet Union, get them out of Lithuania, and they'd head to Japan. And then once they got to Japan, they had to figure out their next destination. Many of them ended up ended up in the famous Shanghai ghetto. Um, others went to Kurosawa, which was one of the major um, ports that received Jap uh, Jewish immigrants. Others came to the US and, and elsewhere. Um, this is a picture of some individuals uh, who were saved by uh, Chuni Sugihara. The um, total number uh, of people who were si saved is estimated between 4,000 and 6,000. Um, but the C Simon Wiesenthal Center suggests that there are 10,000 people who are alive right now who would not have been alive if, if it was not for the valiance of Chuni Sugihara. One of the interesting things about his story too, however, is that um, he fell into anonymity. After the war, he lost his job as a diplomat and he ended up working a variety of different menial um, positions, including selling light bulbs door to door. And so even in um, his eighties, when he was um, named a righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem, nobody in Japan really knew who he was. And, and some people within the Japanese government felt him a disgrace because he had essentially gone against orders uh, to, to process these visas for Jewish refugees. But it was at his funeral in 1986 when diplomats and heads of state from Israel and elsewhere came to uh, Japan for his funeral that the Japanese government realized that he was not just some menial worker, that he was not just somebody who was a dissident, but was actually a, a true hero. So that's a very brief summary of Chuni Sugihara's life. 
Um, if you want to learn more about him, I'll provide a couple of links below so you can you can really get dig into his story. But I want to turn to a conversation with Sam to ask you, Sam, um, as the director of education at HERC, um, is this a story that you have used in, in your work? And, and what is the meaning of a story like this for what you do at the Holocaust Education Resource Center? Yeah, I think that his story is incredibly unique. He was in one of those positions as a diplomat that allowed him um, a little bit of leeway. Like when we talk about upstanders and the people, like what could they have done? He was a rule breaker. He was a rebel. He saw what was what needed to be done. And he went against his orders to make sure that people's lives were saved. So I think that in terms of like the Holocaust, we always look to the Oscar Schindlers, the Sir Nicholas Wintons, um, names that if you have looked into rescuers during the Holocaust, you might be familiar with. And Sugihara is just another one of those. He was using his position as a diplomat to save lives. And I mean, doing that um, with people that either had incomplete papers, no papers whatsoever, and knowing that he was saving those lives. And just in preparation for this talk, I, I saw a 45 minute clip of a testimony of someone that said like, she and her sister had went into his office and were like crying. Um, and he just handed them these visas and they were like trying to say thank you. And he just kind of waved them off like, don't worry about it, which I just think I, I love that story. I love that he was so willing to do this against um, orders from the government, from the state of Japan and really um, just total disregard for what his future career could hold, did the right thing. And those are stories I always want to highlight when teaching about the Holocaust. Yeah, absolutely. Right now, I know as we um, bring people through this sort of failure on the part of the U.S. government to see um, their see Japanese Americans and people of Japanese descent in the same light that Sugihara saw, you know, Jewish refugees and people who were in desperate need during World War II. Um, as we go through that exhibit and afterward, often our school groups will um, partner with HERC and do a, a workshop called, what is it called? Uh, defining the enemies, denying humanity. Excellent. Yeah. And I think um, the way that Sugihara, what, one thing that I also read about him is that when he was asked about his motivation, he simply saw the people who were coming to him in desperate need as humans, as other people. And I'm interested to know, as, as the director of HERC, um, what is the difference or what do you think maybe gave Sugihara the, the capacity rather than to see somebody as a potential enemy um, to the Axis powers as they had been as they had been defined, but to see them instead through their humanity? That's an excellent question. And I mean, I get that a lot when we talk about rescuers during the Holocaust and like they were, some of them were obviously spoon fed the same sort of propaganda that was dehumanizing the Jewish people. And some of them just still chose to kind of not believe it. And I think that there's like a special breed of people that kind of have that ability to not only not believe that this person is non-human when everyone around them seemingly is on board with it, um, but to, and to not be a bystander. So you could be indifferent, not really think they're the enemy, but not really, not really care what happens, but go, kind of go on that other end of the spectrum and really risk your life um, to save these people's lives that you see are in need of help and um, I don't know if this is getting too academic for a museum moment, but there's this uh, great um, article, I can't remember the name of it now, but by Kristen Monroe, who really dives, dives into the psychology of perpetrators, uh, bystanders, and rescuers, um, especially during the Holocaust. And she basically said they all had the same motivation. They all had the same mindset. All of them, bystanders said, well, I couldn't do anything. What was I to do? Like perpetrator said this was my only path what was I going to do and rescuer saying what could I have done when all of this was happening around me like this is what I had to do and it's fascinating that some people just have that ingrained this is what I have to do this is what I'm supposed to do I can't just let nothing happen um, so he was one of those special breeds of people that I know that when we do programs with students we really hope to kind of get them thinking that way because I, whenever I say that, I don't want people to think that, well, if that's not me, that's not me. 
<laughs> but like you can kind of train yourself to be that upstand or think about what you would do in these situations um, and using what you have available, what resources you have available to benefit others in need. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that's interesting that you mentioned that people in all those categories really just felt like their hands were tied. They had to be a, a, a savior. They had to be a bystander. They had to be uh, a perpetrator. And um, I like also that you mentioned this idea of just using whatever resources were at are at his disposal. In the case of Chiyoni Sugihara, um, who just you know wrote these visas, and um, there are there are stories that you know maybe are mythologized, but where he uh, left just like signed and stamped versions of visas with no destinations that anybody who like could walk in and like do his work after he had left um, the the office in Lithuania could just find anybody who needed a visa and send it with like these authoritative stamps and signatures or that another story suggests that he um, he took as many that he, as he could and, and did you know, a full weeks of work or full months of, of work in a matter of a couple of days. And then he just had all these extra pieces of paper with his stamp and signature on it. And he just was, he was like throwing them out of the train window as he was leaving. Yeah, um, I mean, like he's one of those people that he saw each of those stamps of paper as a person's life. Like that was someone's lifeline. And he was very like, like you said, like writing them off pretty much like anyone that walked into his office could get a visa, which is just fantastic. And I just, again, I'm like referencing that one testimony. So I was on the um, Holocaust Encyclopedia from USHMM's page, like 45 seconds, go watch it, where I just love that his reaction was, don't worry about it. Like you're the hundredth person I've given a visa to today. And this person is looking at this piece of paper, like you just saved my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for him, the, the only resources he had at his disposal really were a pen and a stamp, you know, but with, the, with those two tiny implements, he was able to save, you know, thousands of lives. Another thing that I think is really important about the Sugihara story that I think we'll close with is just that he didn't really have a plan in place for all these people to survive, right? And I think this is really important when we think about how we can actually participate in making the world a little bit better is that we don't have to have the solution written from step A through step Z. We just have to participate in some step along that way. And Chiyoni Sugihara basically gave people the opportunity to leave. And then it was still incumbent upon them and other people that they met to actually figure out a way to survive, right? He didn't, th these people survived on their own and under their own will and capacity and with their like resiliency, right? He just simply, allowed them to, to move to a place that was a little bit less <laughs> threatening to their lives, right? And I think that's really important. Often people, when I talk to them, are interested in knowing, well, how do I make the whole world a better place all at once? <laughs> and I think a story like Sugihara or somebody like Nicholas Winton, you know, they just take, they take whatever the next step is that seems appropriate, right? I, I love that. Yeah, no, that, that was a great little anecdote for this. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Sam, for joining me today and uh, helping us contextualize a little bit about Chuni Sugihara. Uh, for those who are watching, I'll definitely put a link into the testimony that Sam is mildly obsessed with, and you can watch it yourself, see how much it speaks to you as well. Thanks so much for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thank you.